Hey, thanks so much for coming to our YouTube channel. You're about to hear a message from one of our Sunday experiences, but before you watch it, do me a favor and click the subscribe button so you can catch all the new videos coming out each and every week. Enjoy today's message. I'm not gonna be long. You know, preachers always say that, don't they? <laughs> but, but, but really, really, today I'm not gonna be long. <laughs> I want to invite your attention to a familiar passage of scripture, but I don't want the familiarity of the text to cause you to miss the profundity of what the Lord is about to say to you. It is out of the gospel according to St. Mark chapter 6. St. Mark chapter 6. invite your attention today to verse number 35. We'll begin there. Listen to what Mark says to us today. Now when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, this is a deserted place. Now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves something to eat because they are hungry and they have nothing to eat. Jesus answered and said unto them, you give them something to eat. They say unto him, shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? Jesus asked them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they knew, they said, five and two fish. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed, broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish divided he among them all. Here it is. And they did all eat. And they were all filled and the church said amen um i want to talk to you for a few moments uh, from the subject best served when broken you may be seated best served when broken lord do it again in jesus name Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, as we approach this particular text, it's important that we consider perhaps the events that preceded this particular encounter. Mark opens up chapter 6 by helping us to understand that Jesus now goes through several experiences before we get to this particular one. He is now entering into Nazareth with his disciples. And Mark says now that when he enters into Nazareth with his disciples, Nazareth is his hometown. Jesus, who is the son of God incarnate, he is 100% God and 100% man all at the same time. He goes into this town now to perform signs, miracles, and wonders. But when he gets to his hometown called Nazareth, Mark suggests to us that as powerful as Jesus was, he could do no miracle in his hometown. He is now rejected by his home folk. They're saying things like this. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is this not Mary's child? 
And so he is rejected in his own town. It is amazing that you can be anointed and everybody recognizes it but your family. Jesus now is rejected by those who are the most familiar to him. He leaves now this place of rejection and now on his way to uh, Bethsaida, the Bible says that he receives an email that his cousin by the name of John the Baptist John now, who is the forerunner, he is now the one who has been assigned to prepare the way for the Christ whom we call Jesus, has now been executed by decapitation by King Herod. And Jesus, in spite of the rejection in his hometown, in spite of hearing that his cousin John has been murdered by King Herod, he walks away from this experience with rejection, with devastation, and he finds himself, watch this, in a desert ready to run a revival. I, I don't want you to miss this, ladies and gentlemen. He has just experienced denial. He has just experienced devastation from death. And in spite of his own experience, he finds enough within himself to run a revival. It is very important to understand that when we consider what real ministry is, real ministry is not about coming to church in a building on Sunday morning. It, it, it is not about ceremonial uh, consecrated services uh, or even Pentecostal pageantries. But when we talk about ministry, real ministry is about meeting needs. I, I, I sat there and every year that I come to the Hope Church, I am amazed by the multi multiple ministries that you engage in here in Hope Church. And what I discovered is that you have tapped into the revelation that ministry does not begin and end in this building but when we walk out of these doors that's when ministry begins uh, 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 you gotta see this he sets aside his own personal emotional feelings for the greater purpose of helping somebody else I, I, I don't know what you come looking for today but the reason why God blesses you and he brings you out is not for you and I to pin a corsage on our own lapel and pat ourselves on our back but he brings us out so that when we come out we can pull someone else out with us someone shout ministry ministry and mark shares with us here that jesus now is holding a revival in the desert. He is not in a synagogue. He is not in a sanctuary. He is not in a temple. He is now in a desert place. And Mark suggests here that Jesus is there with a group of individuals who are now famished and they're hungry. He says to us that there are 5,000 men, which perhaps suggests to us that there are at least 15,000, at least 15,000 individuals who are now in this same 
same space as Jesus Christ. 5,000 men plus women and children. At least 15,000 people. And while they are there listening to the message of the Christ, please understand this. They are there. It has become a dark hour and they have become hungry I don't know if you've ever been in church so long that you became hungry oh that's a bad feeling that's uh, amen it's hard to concentrate when you're in church and hungry and so they are hungry watch this and yet they have no food Lisa because they are in a deserted Josephus the antique of the Jews suggests uh, that they are in a deserted place. Uh, can I suggest to you uh, uh, that you can be in the presence of the Lord and still be hungry? Uh, 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 no, uh, they, they, they are they are in the space uh, in the presence of the Lord uh, and they are still hungry. Uh, I'm telling you the anointing is right there Christ is right there and they are still hungry we must understand ladies and gentlemen that our assignment is not only to minister to the spiritual person our assignment is to minister to the natural individual also it's very hard hard to convince an individual that Jesus is a rock in the weary land and a shelter in the time of storm and they're homeless. It's very hard to convince them. It's very difficult to convince an individual that Jesus is the bread of life and they haven't eaten in 72 hours. What Jesus wants us to understand Hope Church is that while we are preaching Christ it is our assignment to take care of the natural needs to whom we've been called. It is here in this text that Jesus is trying to teach us that spiritual food is necessary because man cannot live Live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It is true, but it is also true that you and I need to know how to minister with balance. Someone shout balance. And so it is here in this deserted place, this desert place that we have over 50 thousand people who are hearing the word of the Lord and yet they are hungry someone shall hungry I need you to I need you to consider the conversation between Jesus and the disciples now understand that whenever you read about the disciples the disciples are indicative of the church the disciples in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John represents to us the church and the body of Christ. They are what theologians call an allegory of the church. So now you have the disciples, the church, who's there in this deserted place with these hungry individuals. Jesus is there and they come to Jesus and says to Jesus these folk are hungry what are we going to do with over 50 15,000 hungry people. There's no Burger King out here. There's, uh, there's no McDonald's, no Chick-fil-A. There's no Taco Bell. What are we going to do with these hungry people? Look at what Jesus says. Jesus says, feed them. 
feed them. The disciples, which represents the church, says, send them away. Get rid of them. It's not our problem. It's their problem. And Jesus rebukes the church and says, no, you don't send them away. You feed them and minister to their need. Please hear me. It is a conversation now between the Christ and the church. The church wants to send them away. Send them down to one of the social centers. Send them away to one of the DSS locations. And God says no. The church must be equipped to meet every need that comes into the house. Here's the church's excuse. They say we don't have we don't have anything it's a desert place and we don't have anything the Lord begins to get frustrated because the Lord wants us to always remember that we must stop complaining about what we do don't have and begin to focus on what we do have. I'm not going to be long, but tell your neighbor, I don't have, but I do have. Amen. I don't have. It's very easy, ladies and gentlemen, to begin to complain about what we don't have. But God says now the miracle is not in what you don't have. Have, the miracle is in what you got left. And I want to talk to about 700 of y'all today because the enemy does not mind us coming to church every Sunday and singing the wonderful worship songs that Jacob and this team led us into. He doesn't mind us doing that. The thing that he never wants us to do is to not focus on on what we lost. Everybody in this room, everybody who's watching us via live stream over the last five years have lost something in our life. I just need a few witnesses. Would you wave your hand if over the last five years you lost some things? But God says, don't focus on what you lost. Praise me for for what you got left. Oh, I just need somebody in here to begin to praise God for everything you still have even after you lost some things. He says here to the church, it's very interesting because he now says to the disciples, you've already told me what you don't have. I want to know what you do have. Listen to the dialogue. All we have, all we have are two fish and five loaves of bread. If you're from the 60s and 70s, you can imagine it was wonder bread. <laughs> all we have is two fish. Five loaves of bread. The Lord says, you got to hear this. Bring what you have to me. Bring it to me. Because I take little. <laughs> and I can make it much. I got to help you understand before I go to my seat. And so now in verse 35, if you read verse 35, verse 35 describes this place now as a deserted place. It is a desert. It is now in the Middle East. I, you know, sometimes uh, we who are part of the Western culture, uh, that it, many times it is very difficult uh, for us to uh, put ourselves in mi Middle East. Eastern culture. In the Middle East, the 
deserts. They're cold. They're, they're hot, hot, hot during the day. And they're cold, cold, cold during the night. The tremendous swing of temperature it uh, for, uh, doesn't allow vegetation and growth to take place. There's tumbleweeds and it's a dry place. If you understand the Middle Eastern ecosystem, you will understand that the extreme hot climate produces thin poor soil and it is sandy there's no vegetation there's there's no growth there's no life but if you read verse 35 you've got to see that because verse 35 is amazing because before Jesus begins to work this miracle verse 35 says this and I've got to let you see this verse 35 says uh, let's see here let's see uh-huh let's see all right here it is and when the day was now far spent it is nighttime his disciples comes to him this is a desert place a deserted place but when you look at verse 39, here's the miracle. He commands them to sit down by companies upon green grass. I don't want you to miss this. They are in a desert place, in a deserted area with extreme heat and no vegetation. And yet, in this desert place they experience green grass come here have you ever been in a desert place and experienced green grass have you ever experienced a season in your life where it looked like there was no productivity like there was no growth like everything in your life was dry and dead I mean your money was funny your change was strange you're sick in your body hell breaking out in your family and yet your testimony was that the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want he makes me to lie down in green pastures have you ever been in a desert place and you were living in green pastures that's what I want you to understand. You can be in a desert place where nothing's happening for you and yet look like everything's happening for you. I don't want to bother you too much, but I just want you to tell your neighbor, I don't look like what I've been through. I don't look like what I've been through. Some of the things I've been through should have lost more hair by now. Should look 60 years older by now. But he kept me in a desert place and allowed me to experience green grass. I need somebody to praise God because he'll keep you even in a desert place. Even in a desert place. Understand that there is a place in God where you can be at the bottom of your valley and even at the bottom of your valley, be higher than most folk are at the top of their mountain. I wish I could help you. <laughs> Have you ever needed somebody to encourage you, but you ended up encouraging them? <laughs> oh, I'm trying to tell you. You can be in a desert place and have green grass testimony. <laughs> because the Lord helps us to understand. It is not about where you are. It's about whose you are. And the Lord says, even in the valley, I'll be your lily even in the valley. So here it is. Lisa, watch this. Jesus takes two fish, 
five loaves of bread. He has to take it out of the hands of the disciples. Because if this is going to be the miracle, it will not happen in the hands of the disciples. So he takes these two fish and five loaves of bread. He takes it out of their hand and puts it in his hand. Watch this. And immediately, someone shout immediately. Suddenly, somebody shout suddenly. What was insufficient now became abundance. What was, what was not enough in their hands now became more than enough in God's hands. What was lack of in their hands now became too much for in God's hands. You got to watch this. It's the same two fish. It's the same five loaves. The difference was whose hand they were in. I'm trying to help you. In the disciples' hands, it was not enough. But in God's hands, it became more than enough. You got to get your situation out of your hand. You got to take your situation, your hand off of your situation situation because it's not about whether God's going to do it or not the miracle depends on whose hand that it's in you have to ask your neighbor tell them it's a difference it makes a difference on whose hand that it's in I'm trying to tell you you put a baseball in my hand and you'll get a strikeout every time but you take that same baseball and put it in the hands of Hank Aaron you become the home run champion because it makes a difference whose hand that it's in you get a basketball I know Jordan is a basketball he thinks he's a champion I know but you get a basketball and put that basketball in my hand that basketball will give you a bunch of missed shots but you take that same basketball put it in the hands of Steph Curry, it'll give you an NBA championship because it all depends on whose hand that it's in. You take a golf club, put it in my hand, and you'll get a disaster. But take that same golf club, put it in Tiger Woods' hand, and you'll get a PGA victory because it all depends on whose hand that it's in. Take a tennis racket, put it in my hand, and somebody's liable to get hurt. But take that same tennis racket and put it in the hands of Serena Williams, and you'll get a U.S. Open championship because it all depends on whose hand that it's in. A staff in Moses' hand, a trumpet in Joshua's hand, a slingshot in David's hand. A cross in Jesus' hand. I'm trying to tell you, put your problem and all of your sickness and all of your struggle, put it in the hands of God. And everything, everything, tell your neighbor, take your hands off of it. Take your hands off your children. Take your hands off your money. Take your hands off your sickness and put it in the Lord's hand because he's got power to take what you can do and work a miracle in your life. I just want to know there are about 500 people in here that need a miracle before September. I dare you to open up your mouth. Give God a pray. Tell him I'm taking my hands off. The reason why, the reason why we lift our hands, it is the, it is the Hebrew word, it is the Hebrew word, yadahe. It's not yadah. This is yadahe. It is the Hebrew word for praise. And it means I lift my hands unto praise to God. 
And the reason I lift my hands is because I'm saying to my God, I'm taking my hands off of it. See, praise is not only to make you run. Praise is to show God, I trust you more. I need somebody in here that's got some issues. It looks like it ain't working out. I need you to throw your hands up. Tell God, I'm taking my hands off of it. Off my son. Off my family. Off my children. And I'm putting them in your hands. Because you always work. Tell your neighbor he always works. Hallelujah. Here it is. Thank you all for having me. Here it is. He took the fish. Verse 41 says that he takes this, this fish, and he takes these. Five loaves of bread. He looks up to heaven and he blesses it. But then the next thing he does is very, it's very concerning or interesting because he takes raw fish and starts breaking it. Have you ever tried to break up? Raw fish. He begins to tear and rip and dismantle that slimy, scaly, slippery, raw fish. It's a mess. It's a messy situation now. It's, it, 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 it's, 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 it's an inconvenient scenario now because you got fishy, slimy, veiny, scaly fish just being ripped apart. But he's got to break it apart. No matter how messy it is, no matter how inconvenient it is, he got to break it and rip it in order for him to serve it. He can't, I'm, I'm going to close in there. He can't, he can't serve it whole if it is going to meet the need, he's got to serve it broken. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to your house in a minute. And I'm going to go on back to go on back to Charlotte, North Carolina. He has to he has to rip and tear and massacre this piece of fish. And the fish ain't got a say in it. You don't have a say in the process. Wonder what he would say if he had a say in the process. This process hurts. I know I'm in your hand, but this process is painful. I feel like you're tearing me apart. Why are you doing this to me? And if the Lord would talk back to that fish. He would tell that fish because I need to use you. See, 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 let me say this here. Be careful how you say to the Lord, Lord, I want you to use me. That, 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 be, be, be careful because most of the time he don't put a mic in your hand. Most of the time he starts ripping you apart and tearing you apart and working. The thing that looks like the devil is doing is not the devil trying to destroy you. It's God trying to use you. Because if you're going to be a servant, the only way you can be a servant, best use through brokenness. People who run away from brokenness can never serve. 
because you will always be offended because they didn't speak to you. Pastor didn't put my name up on the screen and I fried all the chicken. But when you've gone through brokenness in your life, you don't need affirmation. You don't need someone to call your name. You don't even need them to speak to you. Because they weren't there when God brought you through sickness. They weren't there when your family was falling apart and God held you. Anybody ever been broken in here? I want you to jump up and say he kept me. Should have lost my mind, but he kept me. Should have committed suicide, but he kept me. And I will bless the Lord at all times. He's just ripping and dismantling, tearing apart those two little poor fish. And just when you think, just think that the fish that had enough of being torn and broken and ripped. He said, no, it's not going to serve enough. I got to rip some more. Until these two fish have been broken and torn apart so much that they are now able to serve 15,000 people. I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to go back there. I'm going I'm to close this. He, t- he tells, sis, he tells, um, he says to Jeremiah, I want you to go down to the potter's house. And when you get to the potter's house, I don't want you to go in because I don't want you to, to distract him from the lesson he's trying to teach you. I want you to look through the window. And the Bible says that as Jeremiah is looking through the window, he discovers that there is a potter in the house. There is a potter's wheel, which is made up of two wheels, a larger wheel and a smaller wheel. And the potter has this plate that as he pedals this, this contraption, he's able, the, the contraption causes this plate to go in a circular motion. But on this plate, there's, there's clay, silly putty. There's, there's that clay um, that the potter sits. And as he's pedaling, he's molding, shaping. But this time when Jeremiah looks through that window, the potter is not on the wheel. He's standing, and he's got this piece of glob. And while he's standing with this piece of glob in his hands, he begins to mold and prod and pull and shape and manipulate. And just when it looks like this potter has completed the work on this clay, he smashes it and starts all over again. This goes on for about seven and a half hours. You'll see this says seven and a half hours it goes on. That just when this potter looks like he got every crack out, every, every discoloration, every, every imperfection, right when we thought this clay was ready to, for, 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 for the showcase, he smashes it again. And this is what God says to Jeremiah. He says, Jeremiah, I am the potter. You are the clay. But here's the revelation of the potter's house. And, and, and <laughs> He doesn't put this particular piece of clay on the wheel. He keeps it in his hand. (laughs) 
the, the, the whole time Jeremiah is looking through this window, he never takes this, 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 this imperfect, cracked, uh, 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 confused piece of clay and put it back on the wheel as is his custom. He keeps it in his hand. And he says to Jeremiah, uh, 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 this potter will not put this clay on the wheel because it's special. Hear me. In, in the backyard of the potter's house, it's amazing. There is, there is what is known as potter's field. It's where, Judah, where Judas committed suicide. It's called potter's field. And potter's field is, is full of unwanted clay. Potters that could not be used. But after seven and a half hours, this one piece of clay never gets thrown away. It remains in the hand of the potter. Listen to me. What God is doing in you is not punishment. It's not God trying to get you back for what you did five years ago. <laughs> what God is doing in you that feels painful and inconvenient and unfair is that God sees something in this process of brokenness. You could put me in the key of F. Something in this process of brokenness that when he gets through with you, you going to bless a whole nation. And there are family members that are just waiting for you to get through this process. Thank you for your audience. He takes this bread that is not enough to serve anybody. It ain't no good for nobody but that little boy. And he takes what looks like insufficient. You ever, you ever said to the Lord, Lord, you can't use me. You can't use me. I got a past. I made mistakes. I, I've done things that I'm ashamed of. God says, you are the perfect candidate. And he takes this insufficient lunch. He blesses it. Puts it in his hand and he starts breaking. And he breaks and he breaks and he tears, but it never leaves his hand. That's why you didn't go crazy yet. Because you've been through enough hell, you should have had a nervous breakdown six months ago. Some of you have been through more things than other folk have ever experienced and you've got your mind and they lost theirs. And the only difference is that you're still in his hand. I've got to close. I've got to close. I've got to close. After he breaks it until... This bread and fish has been torn apart to its extreme. Mark says, then he serves it to the people who have a need. This is ministry at its best. Folk think this is ministry. This is not ministry. Ministry at its best is that after your life has been torn apart, and your heart has been broken and your dreams have been shattered and people have dropped you and, and manipulated you and sabotaged your future. After you go through all of that and you survive, God says, now you're ready to be used. And in my closing, after the completion of this excruciating brokenness he gives it to the people here's the miracle in your life what looked like it was not worth serving anybody before it got in his hands now 
not only did it serve over 15,000 people, Mark says there was some left over. <laughs> I'm going to my seat. But I want to talk about leftovers before I sit down. Because some of us have gone through situations in our lives that God has brought us out. But it left some residue. Trauma and anger. Anger. Fear. Low self-esteem, guilt. I don't know if you've ever felt guilty over something that wasn't your fault. And you come out with all of these things that are left over from the thing that broke you. Listen to me and I'm done. God says, not only will I use your brokenness, I'll use the stuff that was left from the brokenness. I'm giving, I'm closing. Read, read Mark 6 when you get home. Because Mark says, after everybody had been ministered to by the broken fish and the broken bread, here's what Mark says. He says, nothing was wasted. I, I want you to just touch three people, tell them nothing is going to be wasted. Everything you've been through has a purpose. Your heart wasn't broken in vain. Your family didn't drop you in vain. Your dreams weren't shattered in vain. God says everything that that situation produced, it will not be wasted. Because even that's going to bless somebody. It is no secret what God can do. My test becomes my testimony. My storm becomes my story. Some of you got a story to tell. You don't get saved and get amnesia. What good is that? When God saves you and he brings you out on the other side of your trauma, you ought to tell somebody. You hear what I'm saying? You ought to tell somebody. God says, and I'm done. Stand to your feet. Thank you. God says to you today, Before I formed you in your mother's belly, I knew you. I knew all of your mistakes. I knew all of your decisions. I knew all of your failures. I knew the people you were going to hook up with that you should have never hooked up with. Just tell your neighbor nothing caught God by surprise. No, he ain't surprised. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you and I ordained you. Watch this. I got four minutes. I ordained you and I sanctified you before. Before you sinned. Before you committed fornication. Before you lied. Before you slipped. He says, I knew you before. So if he knew me before and the steps of a good man, tell your neighbor, I'm not wicked. I just made some mistakes. I'm a good man. Tell your, tell your neighbor, I'm a good woman. I'm a good man. Come on, come on. I'm a good, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm closing. That's, that's, why, that's why Saul could... Saul could step out of his role as king and try to operate as a priest and God rejects Saul immediately. He fires him from being king over Israel. He makes one move. God says, I'm done with you. He replaces Saul with David and calls David a man after his own heart. David lies. 
he sleeps with a married woman while the husband was out fighting for him he gets a married woman pregnant tries to kill the husband to cover up his sin he acts crazy in front of King Achish he does a whole lot of things and God says he's still a man after my heart now you go figure that out it's because Saul's heart was wicked David's heart was weak and every time he sinned he came back and said have mercy upon me according to thy loving kindness and tender mercy I'm trying to tell you everything you've been through was preparing you for God to use you for his glory lift your hands I'm done If there's someone here who does not know Jesus Christ and the pardon of your sins, it would be unfortunate for us to leave out of this worship moment and not give you an opportunity to say yes to God. I heard young folk, I got a whole bunch of you talking about, Pastor, I'm going to do it as soon as I get myself together. You can't get yourself together. Why would we need him if we could get ourselves together? He says, I want you to come as you are. He says, and I'll bless you. And I'll use you. And I'll keep you. It's better to have God and not need him. Than to need God and not have him. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I got, I got to get out of here in four minutes, but is there someone here today, after you've tried everything, and everything has failed, you have showed up in this space today, to say, I'm going to try Jesus. If you enjoyed this message, why don't you go ahead and share it with someone, a friend or a family member, and follow us on social media at Hope Church WR. And we'd love to see you on a Sunday morning right here at Hope Church. Thanks for watching.